we're very, very excited to have not just one, but two very special guests, Lisa Sikat De Luca and John Cohen, both from IBM. Such an honor to have you both on SpacePod. Sure. Hey, guys. I am excited to be on the show. Lisa Sikat De Luca. I'm a director and distinguished engineer in our AI applications business unit. I've been with IBM for 15 years and have always kind of chased the next new innovation and bringing new products to market has been my passion. Uh, right now, I'm focused on digital twins. So excited to talk to you guys about space. Great to have you on the show. Really appreciate your time. Now, John. Oh, gosh. I'm John Cohn. I'm a nerd. Very proud of it. Uh, I've been with IBM. Uh, it'll be 39 years in three weeks. And uh, more than that, between my wife and her late father, we have 83 years of IBM. And um, so right now I'm the IBM fellow for the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab at MIT. I'm a rabid MIT fan. I helped create Vomit for Mont's own MIT club. But uh, the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab is, is IBM's biggest collaborative installation space, if you will, on, on a college campus. It's like my fifth career in IBM, and uh, it's uh, pretty mind-expanding. I guess my role there is kind of Yoda for the, for the lab. I'm the, the old guy. <laughs> so my first question, Lisa, is aimed at you. Given the acceleration of digital transformation, whether that's just because of COVID-19 or just generally the trend, um, we've heard from podcast guests who have been outside IBM, when we've got independent perspectives. So to have you and John, both from IBM, is going to be incredibly relevant right now, especially with your role in the digital twin world and what that might mean to buildings, workspaces, facilities, intelligent asset operations, and so much more. So Lisa, can you kick off with your thoughts on digital twin developments, the impact on that of the pandemic, and basically what you see right now in your position at IBM? I think everything going on in the world right now, especially with COVID, has really shaped all of these companies and organizations that have to start thinking about how do I become digital? It's not just a physical presence that we need anymore. It's also how do we monitor remotely and uh, talk about our assets, not just as a physical thing standing in front of you, but now they're more intelligent and they're starting to talk to each other. They're starting to share data. You're starting to get in additional information about the operational technology related to it. And all of that extra data, that digital transformation, is the digital twin of that asset. When you think about buildings, there's a lot of assets inside them, and each of those can have a digital twin. So what we're doing, we just launched a new offering, it's called the Digital Twin Exchange. And what we're trying to do is you know, level the playing field, allow everyone to get started with digital twins from um, really more of the content or the data side of those assets. So think bill of material, parts list, stocking strategies, all the way up to AI models related to those assets in the buildings. So definitely an exciting space to explore right now. You underline what a previous guest, Sharon Richardson, spoke about, about the importance of spatial intelligence and the context of that as we humans interact with the space around us. It's becoming more important. So one could argue now that a digital twin is more than ever a vital tool for real estate and facility professionals. So John, over to you. Can I provoke you to give an AI perspective on the same debate around buildings, workspaces, and us human. I'm not programmed to respond to that, Paul. That's great. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a pleasure uh, being here talking with Lisa and with you both, Pauls. But, uh, you know, Lisa and I go way back and I, I'm very interested in how the digital twin stuff works. And, you know, if I think about digital twins, you know, if, if, if they say space is the final frontier, I would say AI is the next frontier. You know, what's interesting about digital twins, this I learned when, when uh, we were all collaborating uh, around the Munich building, is digital twins, the first level of that is, is sort of measuring what the space is doing now or what it's done in the past and, and how it's being used, you know, how efficiently, you know, how, who's in it, et cetera. Um, what I think at the intersection of AI and, and, and space utilization and digital twins is once you have a digital twin and you can, you can bring in of how the space is being used and how the space is, is performing, um, if you want to start doing anything predictive, AI is a funny term. It can mean many things, but in some sense, you know, artificial intelligence is how you predict how the space is going to perform and, and try to do things a little bit more proactively. So if I want to know how a space is going to be used, so for example, you know, do I know when, when some area might be uh, very busy? That might be very handy. I mean, one of the little gadgets that we actually, one of the most popular gadgets that we built in the Munich Center was a, a little warning bar. It was a little piece of art, but it told you when the cafeteria was busy. 
you know, so the idea of being able to predict that and sort of so you could plan your day is very useful, but it gets to be higher stakes when you start thinking about, well, how much power is this building going to be using? A huge portion of, of the energy load of a city and, and eventually the carbon load of a city is in cooling and heating, particularly cooling. And if you could anticipate how a building was going to be used and, you know, and, and regulate the, the atmosphere, you know, regulate the environmental things so that it, it balances, it's comfortable to work in, but that it anticipates what the, the use might be. I mean, that's a very simple artificial intelligence, you know, application to, to be able to do these predictive models and to be able to, you know, in, integrate other insights in terms of, you know, schedule, in terms of weather, et cetera. And while that might be very rudimentary, it, it can make a huge difference in, you know, how energy, you know, how, how efficiently you manage your building. And ultimately, you know, that, that's a cost, that's a green in the sense of green money, but it's also very much of a, you know, if we, if we start doing that in, at large scale, it can make a big difference environmentally. You know, I think that, you know, you, you mentioned within a kind of COVID period, it even has more importance because if I want to be able to safely bring an enterprise back to work, I need to be able to know something about what their, their movements through space and where they might congregate and where they shouldn't. And, you know, how, if I'm going to go in and, and bring back my workforce at lower density, how do I anticipate uh, what I need, and going back to the environmental thing, you know, how do I anticipate what the building needs to do for a smaller uh, human load? So a lot of that is is building simple predictive models, which is really rudimentary AI. And so I think space and AI are a very good partner. Uh, John, yeah, that, this is great. Uh, and now Lisa, one for you. So in your role, you sit across multiple industries. So I wonder, are there any stories outside the world of buildings and real estate that might make for industry, interesting learning? And also, how does this tie in with the digital twin exchange project you're currently leading for IBM? Sure. You know, we're, we're just getting started with our digital twin exchange uh, that I mentioned, but we're targeting a lot of asset intense industries. So think oil and gas, energy and utilities, transportation, um, even our buildings and operations teams that are looking into how do we improve or know a little bit more about how people are moving about the venue, kind of like what John was saying, right? So with us, we say that you can't have AI without a digital twin for asset intense industries because the digital twin is that system of record. It's all of the data that you're feeding into an AI model to train it so that you can start doing the really cool things like prediction, um, like doing preventative maintenance, all that stuff that will come from the data itself and the insights from that data. Um, I think it's fun to hear about how people are saving in energy costs related to their buildings. So I just understanding how the building is operating and then talking about COVID, you know, our Watson works and back to works. How do you understand how people are interacting with each other and spacing out properly? Um, contact tracing is going to be huge, right? And uh, when people are going back to the offices, there's all new regulations on how they can interact with each other, how often it has to be cleaned, how often the restrooms and eating facilities have to be clean. So a lot of that will need to manage just from the data itself that the building is talking and breathing, right? It's alive. And I think it's just really topical at the moment with uh, people returning to work. So uh, certainly, I think some some of the the uh, the stories that we've heard that organisations are looking for, you know, I guess a lot more reassurance around the environment they're bringing their staff back to than what they've ever had before. So it, it feels really topical at the moment. And I, I guess what I, I'd also just like to ask you like a, a second part to this question is perhaps, you know, you're looking forward, hopefully when things get you know, back to uh, you know, a, a, a more of a, a sustainable normal is, you know, say in the next five years, you know, there'll be uh, no doubt that some emerging innovations that will, you know, accelerate the role of the digital twin. And I wondered if you could share a couple of areas that, that interest you. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I think 3D printing is going to be super cool, especially when you predict a failure for an asset. If you can up and 3D print a part without having to worry about having that part in inventory or in your stock, it'll save a lot of money. And, and how fun is that? Right. <laughs> I think that's a cool area. Um, edge computing, right. Understanding how we take the data for, for off of the devices themselves and start to paint that picture of the digital twin of the asset, which is not necessarily reporting in real time. Um, that'll be a fun area to explore as well as blockchain. So how do we keep a system of truth right around how an asset is transferred between ownership or how it evolves over time or just 
you know, the data itself that's coming from the asset, uh, giving it that kind of sense of authority. Those are the areas that I'll be exploring for Digital Twin. That's funny. If, you, if we'd had this conversation yesterday, I had the coolest 3D printed thing on my desk. I'm doing a collaboration with my brother. Uh, yeah, so I, I have a bunch of 3D printers at uh, Makerspace here. and I love the technology. I will say we have to be careful because we fall in love with technology. It's really the application of the technology. You know, like uh, up until recently, a lot of the 3D printing I did was because I could. But it's really coming into its own as the technology kind of you know, evolves and, and can print in more than, you know, just cheap plastic. And I've, I've, I've seen some stuff in buildings that's just amazing, you know, printing in concrete, printing in glass, and certainly printing in metal. So I think the technology's uh, kind of coming into its own for sure. And the 3D printing, I think, yeah, I've never actually thought of it like that before, but that sounds really interesting. You know, you, the, the system's predicting a failure and it's already made the part to, uh, to replace it. So yeah, really interesting. So guys, I'm thinking about, you know, IBM, you know, where we sit, we've always managed to find innovative ways uh, for decades to help people get through crisis. And, you know, we're seeing a number of events coming together at pace right now that is challenging our thinking and therefore the role of tech. So my next question to you both is this. Buildings are often very loosely coupled as a true digital asset, unlike a car, for example, or an aircraft, that it's a tightly coupled data asset, high levels of engineering, automation and prediction so you know either lisa or john how do you feel about this personal point of view and the role of data to make buildings become a much more tighter manageable asset in the in the way that we talk about digital twins and the use of ai lisa, what do you think i kind of really you're the expert in this that i you you're who i would call <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's definitely a, a difficult problem because not all of our assets are to the point where they are intelligent enough to have that real time view of the building as like a, a thing, right? It's like a human body where it's pulsing and moving as one unit. It's, it's too disjointed right now. And that's where we're struggling with digital twin is you can do a digital twin of one particular thing, but to get that whole picture is a lot more difficult and requires almost a one off solution that services organization and very heavy very expensive to implement. Um, so I think it'll get better over time as we start making sense of the data and figuring out what's noise, what to throw away and what's useful and then marrying that with the operational data, not just the insights that you're getting from the sensors. Um, I think that'll be really interesting to watch. You know, um, yeah, what's an interesting thing is I, I was taken by something you said earlier, Lisa, is that you can't have AI without a digital twin in a building. And I totally believe that. Um, you know, I think we're coming out of an era, you know, buildings are big, expensive assets. They take a long time to, you know, to, to refresh. You know, you have a city, it's got buildings in it, and, and you build, you know, you're only building at a certain rate. And I think we're kind of coming out, well, we're starting in an era where everything is a retrofit and trying to do a digital twin as a retrofit has lots of issues. I mean, just mechanically trying to instrument, you know, put the IoT in after the fact is, you know, like as we did in, in the Munich building, um, is tough, you know, it's expensive and, and it's, you know, it's, it's not as optimal, but I, and, and, and the ROI might be more complicated, you know, in, in a retrofit. There's certainly things that you can do, but I think that as the digital twin idea becomes more pervasive, you know, people will be designing it in. And I think that there are, there are the, the ROI becomes higher because you can, um, I'm kind of interested uh, Lisa, what you think about this, you know, I, uh, we have a, I should be a little careful about how I describe this, but we have a, an industrial partner in our, our uh, the MIT IBM uh, uh, AI lab has a, a very strong industrial partner. And one of them is a large construction company. And they're looking at how do they do large industrial uh, construction uh, projects and how can you determine that the thing is actually being built to scale, to, to plan, you know, you need a digital plan. And it, it, to the extent that becomes the blueprint, it's not an after the fact, you know, you're not building the digital twin after the fact, you're actually designing the building around the digital twin. And as it, as it comes to life, as the building starts to come, it, it doesn't all come, you know, pop out of somebody's head. It goes in system after system, floor after floor. And to try to determine, is the thing being built correctly? And at what point does it deviate? Is it being built safely? Is it being built to schedule? Is it being built to cost? And to, to be able to actually have the digital twin evolve as the building itself evolves and then go on to help the operations of the building, I think that there's a, 
a really cool, uh, um, you know, extended value of that. And so we've been doing a lot of work. Uh, you know, we have a pretty interesting project that can actually using simple uh, measurements like just cell phone cameras, be able to calculate, you know, what systems are, you know, how, how far along and is the building being built to the digital plan. So I think kind of we're moving to a place where buildings will be built as digital natives. And uh, I don't know, do, is that, uh, that's my thought. I'm kind of curious, Lisa, do you see that actually happening as much as we see it in at our lab? I do, and there are different phases, it's almost like there's a life cycle, like you're mentioning more of the construction or initial design side of an asset or a building. Um, I saw a stat where 90% of buildings were over 10 years old, to your point, right? So we have to do a lot of retrofitting. So then there's that opportunity of, if you are designing something brand new, how, what's the ideal or what do you do and how do you justify the extra costs for the benefit of, of you know, making things more intelligent? So I think that's interesting. And then on top of all that, it's like the people become something really critical to the building itself. How many people are in there? How are they moving? How are they interacting with each other? Especially when it comes to COVID and that contact tracing and occupancy sensors and all of those enabling technologies. Um, the spaces depend on the people and depending on how many are there you're going to change a lot of things about the building itself so um, just so many cool things in this space it's hard to put a pin on exactly where to get started now i've always been a, a keen follower of aircraft and aviation and i can't help thinking that the covid crisis you know might accelerate digital innovation you know in a similar way uh, to you know for example the, the second world war you know where the air force started off with biplanes and ended up with jets you know what, what do you think i think one of the biggest areas that we're seeing change moving fast is how retailers operate right um, right now people can't go into a store they can't do a purchase so retailers have been very fast to now offer a curbside pickup, right? So some of them were adopting buy online pickup in store and some weren't, and now all of a sudden they have to in order to survive and to continue selling their products. I think that's a, a great example of how they should have moved faster <laughs> and now they have to because COVID exists. Um, but a lot of industries are gonna see quicker change uh, to a digital transformation type of solution. I, You know what I think is really interesting is uh, just the the, ability to change you know we often think uh, we can't change you know there's so much intellectual weight and process and everything around big decisions and then when you don't have a choice you know when you have this world pandemic everything was open and i think that it you know more than yes it, it clearly is setting the economy back and kind of you know tamping down a lot of things i think it's opened some cracks that that we can adjust you know think about you know, teleworking, it's gonna be a long time before people, you know, force people back into offices, you know, I think everybody's gotten comfortable in this, or it's not just that kind of thing. It's the rules are now everybody sees, you know, the rules are kind of a myth, you know, and, and anything can change. And so I'm enough of an anarchist to say that, well, I certainly wouldn't wish this on the world. Um, it just does show that, you know, progress can can happen when you don't have a choice. I know, you know, I'm a, I'm a parent and I have four little kids and this has been so hard on working parents. Like my kids, I just got a survey from the school district on the options for back to school in the fall. And they're just, it, it's impossible. Like one of us has to quit our jobs, it's that bad. It's like um, the options are one day a week the kids go in or two days a week the kids go in. And then the rest of the time they have this distance learning there's just going to be a whole generation of children that are not as educated as they should be or you know parents that are forced to stay home that otherwise could have been in the workforce worldwide that educational gulf um forgotten generation all these words that you hear a lot i i, I completely share with that and, and whilst technology can help and there's lots of areas where it can't help because people can't have access to the technology even when you have the best technology i mean the four of us are privileged that we're probably in quite a good environment um, to do this call, even when we have the technology, it still is not necessarily the experience that we can sustain. Uh, you know, web, 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 webinar weary, Zoom fatigue, whatever you want to use. Um, I, I just worry about our levels of concentration and uh, well-being and the neurological challenges that uh, people are facing um, as we go back to whatever normal is. Yeah, 
my husband had a good idea. He's like, there's all these buildings that are just empty right now, right? We've got churches, people know people aren't going to churches. Why not take a school and make smaller little schools, right? In nearby buildings that aren't being used so that people can go back to work. That's a great suggestion. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, and, and again, in a way that's quite topical because we've had, we had uh, Mike Getty from CBRE talking about, you know, fluid workspaces and actually, you know, the neighborhood community might become more of the IBM, for example, the, you know, where I go. And, and, and it's funny, I, we, I was on a kind of a design thinking, and I've got to ask you about that as well, a design thinking call with someone the other day, and we did a mini workshop um, with the people. And I, to provoke them, I kind of played the role. And I played through this example and i know you two are going to tell me you can do this so this is going to be fun but um and i play this idea that here i am sitting where i am in in, in my postcode my post here i have no idea how many other ibm people live within five miles of me and i've got no way of finding out but wouldn't it be cool if i could find out and i could create a whatsapp group i could create a community and then go to a school or a disuse something and actually go and meet people because at the moment I can't do that. So, uh, and, and a lot of people echo that and said, yeah, that would be really cool. I don't wanna go to London. I don't wanna take the chance, uh, maybe the cost. I can't do that um, unless I you know, use sort of my own network. And, and I think that's where it gives us a chance to think differently. Um, so uh, Paul, I'm gonna steal your thunder ever so slightly because I just wanna ask this question for John and Lisa about design thinking, because I sense there's a movement more towards challenging the problem statements like we've seen with health and COVID-19. Do you, do you agree? Do you think design thinking, which I know is at the heart of IBM, do you think there's a shift more towards that approach? Permission to be provocative? I think design thinking has really changed the way our company has worked in our industry, you know, in the sense of making things more design, you know, uh, I'm sorry, uh, you know, client focused. And I think that's been really good. But I think that you have to be really careful with things like this where they become the new religion and you know you you issue somebody a black turtleneck and say hey you know you're a design thinking coach i think that we have to shake it up a little bit i think that i love design thinking i am i'm a member of the religion you know the cult of yellow stickies but i think that we put so much focus on you know the brainstorming and that there are no good no bad ideas and you know everybody's smarter together I think that we have focused too much on the ideation and not enough on experimentation. And I, I would like to see us, I, I do think there are bad ideas. To say to, to someone else, you know, I'm sorry, that won't work, even if you're wrong, uh, is how ide ideas are formed by, by battle hardening them. I mean, and I, I know, I anticipate that you're gonna say, well, yeah, there's a phase for that. But I do think a little bit of pushback, even at inception is really important. And that you can't declare victory just because the yellow stickies are done and somebody's gathered them up. I would like to see us move to a culture of quick experimentation. And, you know, and I know that there's buzzwords for that, fail fast, et cetera, but it's actually getting your hands dirty and using that to try out ideas, even in simple experimentation. So I, I just feel that we've, we, you know, design thinking has done a lot to make us more agile and, and kind of shake people more creatively. But Edison was credited with this. Many people have said this, but it's, you know, a, a, a successful idea is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. I think they need to be mixed a little bit more. I don't know. Is that provocative? Yeah, you know, I, I agree that it should be iterative and it's not a one done with design thinking. It should continue to happen throughout the whole process of bringing a product to market. I am um, actually, I launched a inner business within IBM, it's called the Agile Accelerator, and that's exactly what we're trying to do is to fail fast and experiment fast. We had a winner um, for this, this latest competition that was announced in February, and we're already pivoting onto a new idea because we did a lot of market research and determined it's just not the right business decision, and it's all surrounded by innovation and thinking about how, what's the best business decision for us as a company. But um, design thinking is a huge part of it. I definitely wasn't on the design thinking train my first time doing it. Um, I'm more of a problem solver, so I like jump right into the solution. But uh, over time, I've, I've come to appreciate the process. And return to work is a hot topic right now as organizations plan to open up buildings and we have our Watson Work initiative that combines health, well-being, contact tracing, and also space occupancy insights for safe re-entry. So against this background, I wonder if you had a view 
on the next five years, say, of innovation and where you see the big steps taken that might be interesting for our listeners? Yeah, you know, it's a hard question for me because I've spent my entire career working from home. So I'm thinking about, okay, what are we doing differently? It's um, a lot of the work for Watson work. I think that there's some really cool things that we're doing there with workplace safety, facilities management, right, contact tracing, and just giving advice on how close people should be uh, in proximity to each other. Uh, My team specifically on Digital Twin isn't necessarily working in that space of bringing people back to work. One of the most exciting things I'm working on right now is contact tracing. We have collaboration with the MIT Lincoln Labs and MIT uh, with IBM Research. And we're working on a, a contact tracing and working very closely with some of the, the, the tools that Lisa mentioned earlier. So uh, Watson Works and a Worker and uh, Maximo Worker Insights on, you know, for various situations, particularly around enterprise, how do you bring people back to work safely? And how do you do contact tracing in a way that's completely privacy preserving? Because that's the, you know, the, the, the scary scenario that, you know, you don't want to take more information than you need. Uh, so the technology behind that is really fun. I mean, one of the projects we're doing now, which is kind of cool, is uh, so we're we're working on um, using Bluetooth like the rest of the world uh, you know, to to try to figure out when people are within two meters for more than whatever it is, uh, half, 15 minutes, half hour, depending on the, the spec. And it turns out that that's not that, you know, there's a lot of false positives. So we're actually using some work from MIT uh, that uses ultrasonics to confirm. So it uses Bluetooth to sort of measure, and then it uses ultrasonics to try to weed out false positives. And uh, it's fun, you know, it's writing code, writing Android code, writing iOS code. Um, so I, I think, it, and, and using a little bit of AI, certainly an IoT application. So it's 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 really fun. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, this this pandemic has shown us one thing is this probably isn't the last time we'll need this. So this is a, a, a good investment. And I can say very proud of the company that, you know, we we're working across, you know, research, uh, Lisa's group, you know, we're all coming together to, to try to solve this problem. As, as I was listening to you both, I was I was thinking the question I, I really wanted to also make sure I asked you and you've just given me the nudge there when you talked about content tracing is, the role of the smartphone, and I'll just say smartphone for now because it, I'm sure the footprint will change over five to 10 years, but, but probably not. So the role of the smartphone in both digital twin and also you know, giving the human being more control over their workspace. And, and, and a lot of people are talking to me about autonomous workspace where people have choice to physically where they put, put their, their bottom for their day, but also maybe the times of the day or fitting with family patterns. And that's going to be really change a lot. Um, so the smartphone and all the connectivity that, are, that follows 5G and stuff like that, I'm not going to say the missing link because it clearly is a major role, but could mean more of the opportunity to get a digital or a twin of a person in, in a building. And, and maybe I'm rambling slightly, but the role of the smartphone, is that going to be something that we think will accelerate in the next five to 10 years to help us get through this space uh, challenge, which is really what we're, we're trying to talk about? Go look up... Uh ibm.biz, B-I-Z, slash Veramin, V-E-R-E-M-I-N. So it's a visual theremin, but go try that out. But that's using AI natively on a phone. So that's clearly going to happen. And I do think it's very exciting because you can put so much smarts there. And then from the phone, you can jump back to, you know, any amount of compute. Uh, and uh, especially as we start to get bandwidth, things like 5G will make that the, the the distance between that compute and storage so much shorter electrically that um, you know you'll be able to do anything. But I will say that you know just like I was saying, you know, COVID changes everything. You know, the way we, we sort of fall into a paradigm. And, and while I think the phone is 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 an amazing thing, you know, I have hundreds of apps and I write apps and stuff on my phone. I think that uh, what's going to emerge is, you know, I think wearables will come into their own. And I think the idea of, you know, having one master phone device that you always carry with you is, is a great idea. But as you're already seeing with smart watches, et cetera, um, I think that there's going to be evolution and maybe some diversity of what that, that platform looks like, you know, that, you know, what, what is it that carries our personality around and that we, we do those anticipation, you know, you've seen things with glasses or pendants and things like that. I'm, I'm all for diversity, you know, in some sense, you know, things like the mouse and screen paradigm, which didn't exist one day and the next day it did. And now we all fall into it. The idea of a phone existed as the only thing. And then a tablet, I 
sometimes think we're, we're, we're too quick to say, oh, well, that's the final thing. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about, you know, I think 5G in particular will allow you to put, for lack of a better word, dumber things together that are, are electrically simpler and are easier on power. And uh, I hope that that gives us some diversity of interaction so that we're not all looking down and thumbing our screens all the time. But I definitely think that that platform of being able to have kind of app culture where you actually can crowdsource the innovation is definitely here to stay. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and, and you know, current issues um, with COVID and everything, it's like technology was there. We were all warned, this thing is happening, it's spreading around the world and yet it still happened and it's you know, destroying us in the United States. So even with all this knowledge, it takes leadership and it takes people outside of the technology area to make change. And ultimately it comes back to us as humans and how we take technology and better the world. You know, one of the things that's funny about technology is as technologists, we always think, well, it's going to be great. And I think the interesting thing is sometimes there's unintended consequences of technology, technological choices. And, you know, I kind of think about, we, we kind of, Lisa, you were talking about privacy and GDPR and stuff. You know, we put all these IoT devices out there and you got to be careful that they don't leak too many secrets about us. You know, they don't, uh, in trying to help us, harm us somehow. Or we start building supercomputers or super buildings and stuff like that that are really hard on the environment. I guess the question that I would dread you asking is, how do we make sure we don't destroy the earth in trying to help things? Um, and Far be it for me to try to answer that, but just don't ask me that. No, just a real heartfelt thank you very much, John and Lisa. It's, this has been just a, an incredible hour. Uh, so just really overwhelmed by, by your presence, the pair of you. So no, thank you very much. Oh, it's fun. And thank you. And Lisa, it's so great to, uh, to be on the same st quote stage with you. You're, you're, I, he's the best inventor I know. <laughs> wow, what a great time to reflect on what we've heard today on SpaceBud. So let me say a big thank you to my IBM colleague, Paul Gatland. And let me finish by wishing anyone who's been listening to us today a very safe day, wherever you are. 